Recording, yes. Excellent. So again, welcome. You're at the Farmers of Color Network Wholesale Readiness Webinar. Um, again, this is in terms of housekeeping, you're all on mute at this time and will remain on mute during the duration of the webinar until uh, later on where we will have some Q&A time and we'll be able to speak freely. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be shared with all of the attendees afterward. In the meanwhile, please use that chat. Please introduce yourself, say where you're calling from and what you produce. And if any questions bubble up, please do put those in the chat as well during the webinar and I'll be collecting those and we'll make sure to cover as many of those as we can during the Q&A portion. Hopefully we'll answer a lot of your questions during the presentation, but we'll try to get to all of those that we don't during that time. Um, again, this uh, is the first in a series of webinars that we'll be doing around market readiness. Tonight we'll be talking about um, what you need to do to best position yourself, your farm business uh, for wholesaling. And in subsequent series, we'll be talking about gap certification, um, farm to school or institutional buying, how to become a SNAP or EBT retailer and working in collaboratives. Um, and just to share some other upcoming program that is on tap at RAFI, if you haven't already, uh, please do register for the 2022 to Come to the Table conference that's happening uh, online. We're still dealing with COVID. Um, and so that's going to be online on March 15th and 16th. It's going to be a fantastic event. So please um, uh, reach out to any of us on this call tonight if you want any additional information, but be sure to go ahead and register and grab your tickets for the upcoming Come to the Table conference. And um, I just realized now I haven't introduced myself. My name's Lakita Smith. Uh, I'm the program manager at the Farmers of Color Network. And at this time, I'm going to turn the floor over to my coworker, Nikki Presley, uh, to share a little bit uh, about resources for resilient farms. Thanks, Lakita. Um, so we just wanted to share a little bit about a program or a project that we, were, that we have here at RAFI for Farmers of Color. Um, through a, a USDA grant, um, we've created this project called Resources for Resilient Farmers, and we're basically offering technical assistance um, on a FSA or Farm Service Agency disaster assistance programs, uh, COVID relief programs, and also just general FSA um, support, whether you're getting a farm number, working with your FSA office. Um, this can come in the form of 101 TA. Um, you can email us at the email on the screen, or you can call us at, at our hotline. And you can also go to our website to fill out an intake form where you can just put in your information and someone will be in touch with you um, within 24 hours. So just this is just a, a resource um, as farmers are dealing with, um, with FSA. If you have any questions, any support that you need, um, we're here to support you and we're here to help. And we also have some upcoming uh, webinars about the F about FSA program. Um, we just finished one on NAP the uh, sort of a non-insured crop insurance program that can be found on our website. And we have some coming up in the uh, upcoming months that you can find in our newsletter or on our website. And I'll pass it over to Ray, who will introduce um, our panelists for tonight. Thank you, Nikki. I'm Ray Jeffers. I work as a program and policy manager at RAFI, where I work on the expanding market access program, as well as our policy team. I have a distinct honor tonight to be our moderator with um, our experts that we have brought to you, and I know that they're going to bring quite a bit of expertise in the field and make my job fairly easy tonight. And uh, I'm just here, hopefully, to start the discussion, the dialogue, and encourage many of you to put your questions in the chat, and, uh, and then we'll also have a Q&A at the end if uh, one of my questions didn't get your question answered. First, we have with us today uh, is Lauren Horning. She is the Director of Local Sourcing and Sustainability for Fresh Point for the past five years. She's developed Fresh Point's local sourcing program in the Carolinas by finding farmers, crop planning, educating on wholesale readiness, working with chefs to plan local menus and developing local programs for retailers. The Carolina Local Program currently partners with over 100 farmers and artisans. So welcome, Lauren. We also have two farmers with us uh, today. First, we have Millet Locklear of New Ground Farms. 
Newgrounds Farm LLC was established in 2015 by Millard and Connie Locklear. Newground Farm LLC is operated by a fifth generational farm family. The farm offers a wide variety of fruits and vegetables along with culinary and medicinal herbs. It is all grown locally on 26 acres of irrigated land by Miller and Connie Locklear. They produce, um, their produce is available at a stand on the farm site on Alvin Road at the local farmer's market through community supported ag. Welcome uh, Miller. And then we also have with us today, Patrick Brown of Brown Family Farms. Patrick is farming land that is that his family has owned for generations in a small community called Hex Grove in southeastern Warren County, North Carolina. The farm was established by Brown's great grandfather, Byron C. Brown, in 1865, and Brown's grandfather, Grover Brown, and father, Reverend Dr. Arthur A. Brown, all farmed the land, raising livestock and growing vegetables, grain, and tobacco. Patrick took over the farm after graduating from Federal State University and traveling the world as a federal contractor. Brown Family Farmers mission is to help provide an alternative holistic solution to customers naturally by processing and manufacturing carbon neutral plants like industrial hemp, natural herbs and organic vegetables. So welcome, Patrick. I'm going to uh, kind of go through the questions and uh, and just kind of start with our panelists and I may call you so we're not always starting with the same one uh, each time. And uh, our first question will be for our farmers and then Lauren, you can kind of add there on the end and we'll start with you, Miller. But we wanted to talk a little bit just about establishing that relationship. How did how did you go about maybe either reaching out or establishing that relationship with, uh, with some of the wholesalers that you work with? Um, probably, I went to, I took the School of Business at Federal State to from the, Ms. Uh, Hawkins and stuff. And um, she introduced us to the, the Center of Environmental Farming. There was a 10% or 20% program. They were starting up working with uh, universities, I think. So um, she went through and introduced all the different um, requirements and everything that was required. So then once got we got working on our, through our business plans, we started. I went through uh, the GAP training with us uh, through that program, and I met Lauren some, sometime during that process. I met her, and then we started um, working together once I got through all the training and development. So I come harmed it. I mean, come GAP certified in 2015, and been certified ever since. I come harmed to GAP certified in in 2020, I believe. Uh, so the last two years has been um. Uh, Armory Gap certified. Yeah, thank you, Miller. Patrick? Yes, um, I met um, Lauren Hornberg of Fresh Point Cisco through the um, process of getting my Harmonized Gap certification through the Carolina Farm Stewardship Program. Um, and we uh, develop a relationship uh, of being able to supply produce in their markets. Um, and we have been have been having that relationship ever since to be able to provide uh, fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, thanks to the Carolina Farm, Sip, uh, Carolina Farm Stewardship Program, uh, we are able to identify the needs and values of value-added products from produce to other um, products and being able to solidify that process to uh, various markets. Good. Thank you, Patrick. Lauren, you have anything to add kind of how you or other wholesalers, wholesalers may locate or identify farmers to work with? For sure, yeah. Noan and Patrick brought up two great resources. I think one was um, Patrick touched upon CFSA, the Carolina Farm Stewardship Association. Um, they've been an awesome resource with us through their food safety department. So Kim Butts and Chloe Johnson, who used to work with CFSA, but she's since um, moved on. So they're working to hire somebody else as a food safety coordinator. Um, but both of them will typically reach out to me and say, hey, you know, I've got a farmer who's interested in getting GAP certified. If, if you're interested, you know, let us know or we'll let the farmer know. They've got an awesome conference that I know Millard's attended in the past. And we've chatted at the conference typically in November. So the CFSA conference is a great way to meet both for farmers and buyers to connect. Um, and I would even say social media is, I know Patrick does an awesome job on social media. 
to have put social media pages or a website that buyers can search a hashtag that's um, like North Carolina farmers or gotta be NC. If you're putting those hashtags on photos, it's a way that me as a buyer, I can go in and say, oh, well, these farmers are tagged here. And I, I know that's kind of modern day, but um, for folks who aren't necessarily as, as savvy on the social media or website side, I'd say just talking with neighbors and you know, Millard has told me that he has a cousin who's interested in farming in the future. And so I think that word of mouth is really key too. And if folks are interested in selling wholesale or just have questions, start talking with others about it. Talk with Patrick, talk with Millard. Um, that word of mouth is, is so strong in the farming community. Thank you. We'll stick with you, Lauren, with the next question. Um, is there a typical geographical area that uh, you look for farmers or wholesalers like to work within? So every wholesaler is going to be different in what their geographic range is. So I would say if farmers approach a wholesaler, ask them kind of where their warehouses are or where their trucks go. So for Fresh Point, we have two warehouses in the Carolinas, one in Raleigh, one in Charlotte. And we typically define local as within 250 miles. So from those warehouses, we can either ship back and forth or then we can also ship to other Cisco warehouses that are within the distribution footprint. For Fresh Point in general, nationally, we have warehouses in the Southeast. We have one in Atlanta. We have several in Florida. There's one up in Connecticut. So at, at least in that range, if folks are specifically interested in selling to Fresh Point, just let me know where you're at and I'll work to connect you in with those warehouses. Um, and then just here in the Carolinas, we mostly work out of the two warehouses, Raleigh and Charlotte. Thank you. Our next question uh, for our farmers, and we'll start with you, Patrick, just maintaining that relationship that you've, you've built. You know, some, some farmers may reach out to a wholesaler and they're not, not quite ready to begin wholesaling or um, might not have the capacity. And, uh, but just how do you continue to build that or keep that relationship going? Or even after, once you start selling with, that, with those buyers? Yes, um, I think the most important thing is the quality of the product. Being able to identify that your farm production, uh, uh, depending on the volume, can be consistent. And um, that relationship with the quality and being consistent would always have the customer willing to work with you um, once you uh, create another cessation plan plot for the next value product. So um, communication, consistency, and quality. Miller, anything to add? Uh, yeah, well, like I'm glad you're saying you know, consistency because, uh, you know, y'all heard me and Laura talking about our, our we we're already planning out the, the holidays, Easter and Mother's Day is the type of crops that comes off during that period of time. But also I wanted to add one thing about um, location that Laura touched on was that um, the benefit, the greatest benefit I see, you know, with working with her is that uh, the bike hole sequence. I don't have to carry nothing to roll. I just carried about three miles to a cool of men. A couple of guys got together. They pick it up. And that's one of the greatest um, the logistics things, saving all that time. And the patches tell you the same thing. You you got to figure in your budget. The CSAs that we work with, I might one of them might travel hunting 60 some miles. That's money. <laughs> Lark, I travel uh, right at seven miles. So that is a big difference there. For the same price. <laughs> so you guys both kind of led us into our next section talking about kind of production. How do you go about uh, deciding what to grow and do you work with the buyer when you're deciding or do you just kind of let them know what you're what you're growing and uh, we'll start uh, again with you Miller and then we'll go to Patrick and then Lauren. Um, the, our, you know, we demonstrate our abilities just like Patrick said earlier what we can grow and that starts our talking with Laura or any of the other groups um, is that, you know, winter crops, there's one, there's only a small field of winter crops we can grow in the southeast here, not too much damage from cold weather. So, but then we also talk between us and Laura, we know um, we got a, a little uh, path forward there because, you know, we do replicate, like Patrick said, if you can't replicate it ever 45 days or 35 day crop, you ain't gonna be able to meet the business needs and everything. And that's that's part of the sustainability is to be able to replicate and let them know that, hey, I'm gonna have this for two weeks or three weeks, might have a week gap there, but 
me and him trying to be consistent where we have something every week, and that's uh, still a lot of infrastructure there has got to be put in place to be able to handle all that stuff. But that's one of the goals we're working on. Is I increased my houses uh, one more this year, and I love to increase it three or four more because uh, I still have gaps. Yes, uh, Miller, you brought up great points. Um, I, I would like to just add to that. The most important thing is to have a plan. Um, Lauren does a great job with the strategic plan of what is able to be sold. And um, that works great with the way that I do business because a farmer never wants to plant something that they cannot sell. Um, we can only put so much uh, produce back into the, our compost piles and uh, regenerate it that way. But we always want to uh, be able to alleviate costs by always having a plan um, as we go through each crop season. Um, so that is the most important thing for me is getting a list of things that um, have a great market value for the companies that we sell to, where it's not hard for them to be able to sell it. And we stick to that plan and grow that product for that customer. Thank you. Anything to add, Lauren? Sure. I think you now having both Millard and, and Patrick on the call at the same time is great because both have unique growing styles unto themselves. Patrick focuses, you know, Patrick has great markets developed with multiple different customers. So organic certified, he's looking at growing crops that at least right now you're looking at greens, um, some brassicas, kind of more what we would consider core crops. And then Millard is a little bit more unique in that he has some specialty crops there. So you've got Patrick on core crops and Millard on specialty crops. And so being able to navigate both of those depends on your customer. And for us as a wholesaler, we kind of break those customers into two categories then too, where we're looking at very, I would say chefs who don't have flexibility and change in their menus are more likely going to go towards a core crop. So as Patrick starts to get into some of the, the common crops throughout the spring and the summer, we can filter more of his crops in through those chefs. And then as Miller pulls on more specialty crops, like the Asian eggplant varieties, and, and he'll start to pull on uh, Easter egg radishes and French breakfast radishes, those will typically sell fewer cases of, but they can be geared towards a chef who's going to be changing their menu. And so I think as a farmer looking at what's the, what does your customer mix look like? If you're selling to a wholesaler, if you have a CSA, um, if you're selling to a farmer's market, what are the crops that fit each of those customers? And then talking with the customers on, well, what can they take? So Millard will often talk with me about well, what are specialty crops that we can, that he can grow, that we can sell more of. And that's how we got kind of targeted on the Easter egg radish side. And then Patrick will let me know, you know, hey, I'm thinking about growing heirloom tomatoes in the summertime. So we can look at, okay, what's the specific type? Because Patrick's gonna grow 10 pound mix heirloom tomatoes and Millard is looking more towards a 10 pound mix cherry heirloom tomato. So that allows us as the wholesaler to get very specific on which types of crops to hopefully maximize the amount that the farmers can grow and what they can get a return on. And so I think it's, as a farmer, it's really important to know what do you feel comfortable with growing? And then how can you pair that with what your customers are, are able to take? Great, thank you. As uh, Patrick, we'll go to you real quick for a formal question. Uh, and you both, all three of you really brought up, you know, uh, new varieties or a specialty type crop. When you are growing something like that, that's new or maybe not as familiar to buyers, um, how do you go about, you know, letting them know about it? Do you do samples? Do you, you know, how do you, how do you get that out there? So um, Lauren spoke about this earlier, uh, being able to market whatever you grow, whether it's social media, whether it's community advertisement, whether it's food truck advertisement, any way that you can, adding a community supported agriculture program to your farm is very important as well because you can actually advertise the new product that you're bringing out to an already existing member, that's a great way to identify a new crop that's being sold because a lot of times they, they may say, oh, I didn't even know you offered this product. But when you already have them there at your farm to pick up their normal weekly purchase, you can advertise that plan to them and let them also create a survey and, and 
that information can add to the pharma of things that they may not grow at the moment, but you have a, a customer waiting to purchase it. So you may want to incorporate that plan into the next season. Um, and um, I would just say just marketing. I mean, that's very vital um, in today's age. Um, as a fourth generation farmer, it's something that my father and his father didn't have an opportunity to have. The internet, you can utilize that in the best of your ability and to get not only the story of your farm, but also the products that you have for sale. Thank you, Miller. Anything to add? But yeah, I would add that I also asked the you know some of our different customers. You know, I talked to one um, group uh, that was there, especially uh, type of kale or anything like that. You know, like you're saying, you all want to diversify because you want to spend time doing different things. They should have something for the workers to do every day. So I've been looking at more different grains and I'm. As they requested uh, certain one type of mustard and one type of kale that I tried to grow or is growing and everything. And also, uh, like he was saying, Patrick said, you know, he always tried different things. Uh, me and Laura talked about, uh, I'm forgotten the name of that kale last year, Laura, but it, it's, a, it's a number one insect. If you want to draw all the insects to your, your house, you plant that kale and you got a, that tat soil in that kale pulled over. We've seen uh, uh, insects that I've never seen before. So you got to learn to deal when you bring something new into your houses, you're gonna get an insect problem or could increase or decrease the insect problem. And I think Patrick's face lit, light up. So that's that's a, that's a, that's one of the things that you don't, it's a surprise you get when you really ain't expecting it. Really, we'll stay with you real quick. All of, uh, both you and Patrick talked a little bit about um, gap certification, harmonized gap. How important was that to your operation when working with buyers? Well, that's from uh, going from being able to sell nothing to sell 100% of what you produce. Now, we might have some ways because um, food safety is the number one. When the Food and Drug Administration got in there, and uh, they're actually going, they're doing it. Last year, they did 50 guidelines issued. I believe this year is the, we, I got some meetings going on with water sampling and that other thing. So, if you want to be able to produce food and sell it to any institution that a child will consume that food, you better be Harmony Gap certified and everything. Uh, there's no question to me. Uh, I would not be in business if I want Harmony Gap certified. Okay. You're taking a big chance trying to do what we do with specialty stuff and expect a direct sale because we only concentrate on, like sometime I have only three or four things coming off. Uh, a farmer that's going to sell direct, if he ain't got 15, 20, 30 different things, this stand ain't going to move nothing. You can't expect somebody that's come to get a tomato and a piece of uh, corn or squash and that's it. He's got to have 20 things. So I ain't going to staff myself to be able to, to juggle that many kind of crops. Patrick? Yes, absolutely. Um, being GAP certified is one of the most important processes for a farmer that's looking to diversify his farming portfolio. Um, being just a conventional grower, it limits you to certain things that you can grow in certain markets. Becoming GAP certified, it opens a window or a door to the commercial market. It gives us an opportunity to be able to expand our production. And we are so grateful to be able to qualify for that program each and every year. And I would not be in operation um, at the scale that I am at if I was not uh, harmonized GAP certified or just GAP certified. Lauren, from a buyer's uh, point of view, when you see that certification there, I mean, what does that mean for the, for the buyer or for the wholesaler? So every wholesaler is going to have different requirements, at least for FreshPoint. We require that farmers have to have at least a harmonized GAP. And there's different levels of gap. The most basic is the USDA gap. So the harmonized is one step up from that. Uh, some folks will call it an H gap. Um, I would say typically if, if you're working with a wholesaler that's selling to institutions, to large retailers, those customers are requiring the gap audit. If you're working, you know, if you're a farmer selling direct to consumer and, and selling to, direct to chefs or at a farmer's market, it's not as necessary because there isn't that intermediary. So I would say it's mostly when you're working with wholesalers, especially larger wholesalers, that that comes into play. 
And I think one of the, particularly here in North Carolina, I know South Carolina also has a cost share program. I'd say if you're in different states, I saw some a person was from Maryland, um, check with your state department of ag to see if there's cost share opportunities because in North Carolina for the first two to three years, there is a cost share program to get the gap audit. Uh, and if there's free money on the table from the state, I'd say take advantage of it and, and go for it because it, it is an annual cost and it's something to plan for. But just as Miller and Patrick said, it's it opens up doors with wholesalers. It's just making a decision on whether that that's a good decision for, for the future of the farm. Lauren, we'll stay with you real quick and then we'll, we'll go to our farmers. I know when farmers are looking at going possibly from direct sale to wholesale, you know, cost is obviously a, a, a it, it factors in, right? And so uh, um, we get a lot of questions around packaging and requirements and, you know, washing stations, things like that. Uh, could you speak a little bit about any of the requirements that a buyer or wholesaler may have on packaging or, and, you know, how that kind of goes? For sure. Yeah. So typically selling wholesale, we have what are called common industry specs or specifications. And that means that regardless of who you're selling to on the wholesale front, there's common case sizes that these folks are used to buying. So for example, yellow squash is typically sold in a half bushel box. Typically that half bushel box may or may not be waxed to release the transpir or to control the transpiration rate of the squash. So it's not releasing a lot of water and that gives it longer shelf life in the supply chain. So there is a wholesale readiness guide uh, that was put together. I'll try and drop that in the chat. It's a PDF. Um, it was put together by Food Hubs as a way just to kind of open up the transparency of what are common industry specs and, and how should things be packaged. So I'd say always check with your buyer. Every buyer could be different, but at least for us, you know, as we're crop planning with Millard or Patrick, we'll often go through each item and say, okay, Patrick, you're going to pack uh, red kale. Well, we typically bring in a lacinato kale that's a 12 count. Let's match that spec and, and it'll be a 12 counter. With Millard and Asian eggplant, we typically stock a 30 pound case. Um, and I would also say as farmers are looking at, you know, should I wash it, shouldn't I wash it? If you don't have to wash it, I wouldn't suggest washing it because introducing water immediately introduces pathogens and it's going to reduce your shelf life. So if a product can be brushed off or, um, if you absolutely, absolutely need to wash it, if there's a ton of dirt on something, then I would say, yes, consider it. But just know as soon as it goes into a box or even into plastic packaging, that's increasing the chance for bacteria to breed or for the ability to, the, if it's especially lettuce, it'll break down faster. So anytime you introduce water, that always brings up more questions um, that I'd say if, if it's not needed, don't wash and then check with the buyer on the wholesale packaging requirements per product because it's always going to change per commodity. Patrick, uh, then we'll go to Miller. Any any surprises there when you kind of got into that with the packaging or how did you handle uh, going into that? No, uh, not too many um, challenges with the specifications of how it's prepared. Um, you just have to be able to adapt Every uh, buyer is a little different in certain specifications of how things are packaged. But once the communication piece is there, where uh, Lauren, say with Fresh Point, she identifies exactly how she wanted, uh, wants the product to be packaged, we don't really have an issue with it um, because um, you have to be able to have that process of your business in order to be able to sell vegetables. You want to be able to learn how that is, um, how that is done and, how, and what the expectations are in order to be successful because doing that, it also opens up doors to have more clients in the future on the commercial side. Miller? Um, it, there was no major problems there. You know, part of the thing is that me and Patrick too, there's another guideline that we had to, was introduced to what, two years ago when we got a, the, the Fruit and Drug Administration come in and they come up with their guidelines. And so one of the main push for us to get Harmony Gap certified was to say, if you get Harmony Gap, we won't bother you. You won't have to do a food safety plant, but they're going off the sales of that farm. If you sell um, so much indirect, you know, if you're selling straight to a stand, 
you know, all you got to do is have a food safety plan and water samples and stuff like that there. You still got to have regulations associated with it. And you've got some packages and cooling and everything. You still got to meet certain food drug administration guidelines, even though you're direct selling. So I'd rather just have one chance of being all through one organization and not have to worry, try to jump through the hoop for two different organizations or, you know, or have the county health department on that or the extension service. Because right now, what I read in that level last night was if you if you fail to get Harmony Gap certified, you fall up on the Food and Drug Administration guidelines. And so that brings in the county extension agent also. Good to know. Millet, we'll stay with you. Uh, deliveries. We know everything from labor to weather to when we may think things will be ready to harvest and they're not or what, you know, how do you guys juggle um, your harvesting time, your delivery time? What are some delivery requirements? Are they different? Or are you able to work with the buyer or are they set? Uh, could you talk just a little bit about that? Um. No, I, I, it's, it's really a little still flexible for me. I has not took no, you know, contracts and Laura's always been good, you know, that we try not set us as a contract, you know, what my father done, you know, he took contracts and he had to deliver or produce that produce at that given time. I has not pursued any type of contracts with that. I mean, it's a better price that you're guaranteed to get rid of everything, but then there's 50% chance of crop failures, you know, like we're saying the environment's the biggest thing right now. Uh, I've seen more plants die in the last week than I'm ever seen. Cause uh, you know, we, we weren't expecting those 17 degrees weather. It wrought my tomato house. I had a heat in there. So no, um, right now we just uh, still trying to adjust our rhythm of planting and sustainability and and but we're still narrowed down to the size of our operations. You know, we got, you would have to. We see that you would have to you know about double the size of your operation, have a consistent overplant instead of um, to get a good, good, steady production. And I ain't quite ready to overplant. Mm -hmm. right. Patrick, yeah, logistics uh, this year has been more expensive than labor. Um, due to the cost of inflation. As you know, diesel prices are going through the roof as well as food prices and everything else. Organizations like Fresh Point and Lauren has been able to work with us to have the trucks come pick up uh, produce from our farm each week, which helped us out tremendously this year. Um, as we continue to grow, we could add more trucks to our facility where we'll be able to supply logistically to our clients throughout the state of North Carolina. We just haven't gotten to that level yet. However, it's very important to have uh, refrigerator storage to be able to hold produce for organizations so that they can come to your farm to be able to pick up where the food will be intact. And um, just like everything else, um, as Miller spoke of weather conditions and doing this, uh, during our generation are unpredictable. You can't go by the old farmer's almanac or something that was relayed upon with my father and my, grand, my grandfather. These days, you can't even really go by what the weatherman tells you either. So it just takes a lot of understanding of being sustainable, growing infra indoor infrastructures also help a lot. Um, but logistics and labor, it, it continues to go up, but we are able to transport produce, but we, are in a better position if those organizations are willing to come out to our farm and pick up. Thank you, Patrick. I learned hard one year about uh, listening to that uh, last frost date in Albany. I had to replant my corn. <laughs> Lauren, you have anything to add? Yeah, I'd say you know, working with Millard and Patrick, they're, where their farms are at just worked out for us and our logistics routes that the driver who's on those routes has enough time to backhaul. Um, we had worked with Millard for a couple of years that for a while our driver would go out to the farm and then that route changed so he the driver didn't have enough time to go specifically out to Millard's farm. So we have a customer that's close to a, a backhaul site that's uh, basically a cooler um, that's down in Pembroke that we're able to backhaul from, but I would say it's it really depends on fluctuating logistics, it, it, the gas prices are going up substantially. And so as much as we can backhaul from farms, we try to. Uh, it, it just 
can be difficult. I, I think it's it's not a guarantee I would want to throw out for everyone because if, if someone's out in Elizabeth City, we don't have trucks that go out to Elizabeth City. It's just a tough spot to get to. So every farm is going to be different in figuring out the logistics. But I'd say re regardless of what logistics are figured out, the one constant is that the logistics would have to be refrigerated. Whether Patrick delivers to us in the refrigerated truck or whether we pick up on a refrigerated truck, that's super key, especially uh, as we look at hotter summers, because all of that relates to shelf life. When you extend that, that cold chain, that means that the chef and the end customer is going to be happier with the product because they're going to have longer to work with it. And that's the same way shipping product from the West Coast, from California, it rides on refrigerated trucks. So all of that supply chain piece is to extend shelf life for the end consumer. So thinking through that and um, NC State has a great resource called the, um, I think, it's basically it's a pack and cool if you google pack and cool nc state it tells they have the resources on how to outfit a trailer um that if folks aren't ready to get to buying a refrigerated truck i'd look into the pack and cool and kind of get those materials and see what that would look like instead you don't have to go full-blown refrigeration truck you can use a cooler you can use different methods to get to that refrigeration level until you're ready to scale and whatnot there's there's different steps that you can take but i would say all in all it's thinking about how can you extend shelf life through that cold storage whether it's on the farm or through transportation very good thank you Lauren. we'll stay with you real quick really brought up something about contracts and we've got a few questions uh you know people have around when they think they're working with a buyer or a wholesaler uh about being contractually obligated uh to provide a certain amount or you know, what happens if production isn't met, that type of thing. Could you speak a little bit about, you know, contracts? Are they common with buyers or? Great question. Yeah. So I would say it. contracts are usually for massive, massive growers. And I would say they're for small and mid-sized farmers. In the past, like 30, 40 years ago, we saw more contracts than we do now. Now, I'd say as more folks are coming into the the space of local food with food hubs, with distributors. It's more so a, a handshake agreement that we recognize there's weather issues. We know that there are labor issues and transportation issues. So if a farmer wants to say, can you commit a crop to me? It's typically a handshake agreement that we say, here's some volumes. It's not 100% of our volume because that protects the farmer. And if the farmer comes back, then we also hope that they would say, if there's a rainstorm, if they have a quality issue, if there's a fungal disease with the crop, that they'll let us know as soon as they see it so that we can prepare other, you know, other volume inbound. Um, but I'd say contracts, we don't really sit down and make farmers sign a contract. That's, that's not really what we're looking to do and it protects the farmer really. Uh, most of what we're doing is looking at if a farmer's interested in growing a crop, if it's a crop that we regularly stock, we'll talk about what potential volumes we could buy. And if the farmer is comfortable with that, then we'll plan that kind of in the back of our heads to say, okay, Patrick's going to be growing lots of kale. He thinks he might be able to do six to eight cases a week. We'll plan that into our inbound. And then if he can, or he lets us know that something's changed for a couple of weeks, we can pivot with that. I would say the the forcefulness of a contract and that word just brings about a lot of fear and that's not something that we really want to hold people's feet to because farming there's just so much that's up in the air that nobody knows it's so unpredictable anything that add guys not for me i know i um like i said i, I seen what my daddy jumped through and they were thinking i, I want no part of it <laughs> Versus small volumes. Yeah, but I, I feel like contracts are a lot of pressure, especially farming in today's environment. Um, I feel more comfortable uh, doing business without a contract. Very good. Thank y'all. Next, we want to talk a little bit about that price, that market price, or you know, how is that determined? Is that coming from the buyer? Does the farmer have any input when working with the buyer, or you know, how does that come about? Uh, Lauren, can we start with you? 
Sure. And I'm excited actually to hear Patrick and Miller talk about this too, because they'll be able to share firsthand of how we work through pricing. Um, it, one of my best suggestions for pricing, just to get a common baseline, is to look at USDA terminal market pricing. Now, when folks look at those, I'd say here in the Carolinas, Columbia, South Carolina is the closest, but it's important to keep in mind that that pricing is what we call an FOB pricing. So that means that there's no freight factored into it. So um, if you're comparing Columbia, South Carolina market, Carolina market pricing, you're looking at that plus freight to get to your end customer. And that's what we would call the delivered pricing. So typically when we're working with farmers, we're talking about either an FOB, which is pricing no freight, or a delivered price. Uh, it's also really important to look at specs. So in terminal market pricing, they'll talk about broccoli and there will be different numbers after broccoli. We typically stock a 14 count bunched broccoli and then a 20 pound broccoli crown. Each of those will have a different price depending on the labor that's involved, um, depending if the farmer's using ice or not. So really making sure the specs align with what the customer is asking for is super key. Um, and then from there, I'd say we really the goal is how can we get a good price, a fair price for farmers to make sure that they feel that what they're selling their product for is valuable and then that the customer is also willing to pay for what the price is. So I think there's a need for transparency and we try to do this with Patrick and Miller, which is why I'm really curious to hear what their thoughts are on it too, in that if they throw out an idea and say, hey, I'm thinking about pricing this at this price, we'll go back to the customer. If the customer is okay with it, then we'll say, great. If the customer says, well, I need to be here, we'll go back to Patrick and Mellon and say, hey guys, what do you think about this? Does this work? If it does, great. So we're kind of trying to negotiate on behalf of the farmer to make sure that they feel comfortable going into it. And sometimes it, it might not work out. Sometimes we'll go to a customer and they'll say, I need spring mix at $2.50 a pound. And the farmer needs it at $6.50 a pound. So then it just might not work in that situation. But the goal is how can we get farmers more money for what they're growing? And then how can we make everybody throughout the food system understand that it's important to pay the price to farmers because it's a more valuable food? Thank you, Patrick. Yes, um, Lauren is absolutely right. Um, I feel more comfortable with a person like her or an organization to be able to negotiate the price with the customer that they're selling the product to. That way it gives me an opportunity to understand the price point and still try to be able to meet the demand of what that customer is looking for. For example, if the price comes at uh, back at a fair uh, lower rate than what I'm comfortable with, if the customer is willing to increase the quantity, then I'm willing to agree with the price. Um, that helps us out a lot. And the way that we overcome lower price points is growing a lot of produce to be able to meet a high quantity volume and earn that profit margin on that end. Rather to say, no, we don't wanna provide the product to the customer because that's when the um, opportunity of once they receive the vegetables and they love it, then they'll always come back and want more. So that's that kind of helps us out when it comes to that aspect. Um, a lot of people that ask questions like that always want to know because they always ask me, well, how much can a case of produce be leaving your farm? I always tell people if it comes below $22, it's not really beneficial for us unless we have a high quantity of Great info. Miller? Well, um, I, what I do, I look at um, North Carolina issues a weekly report of the wholesale markets of the commodities and different things out there. And like Patrick says, we got to know our true cost we got in that product and then our profitability margin, you know, that, um, and the time it takes to harvest that, you know, like uh, mixed bell peppers and is a whole lot easier to harvest than uh, okras or something like that. So you look at the profitability, you know, because them, them, they can go out and do 10 cases of mixed bell peppers in an hour's time to get, get 10 bushels of okra. That's about seven hours time. So I got a lot more money in that okra. So you just look at, you guys know your, um, your true cost. 
And once you know, a lot of dudes hurting, uh, we it changed what we think we should be and not be. And uh, most of the time, it's, it's very good. I uh, seen very few things. I I thought about the only thing I ever really met her ever disagreed about was mustard. I I can't pick that mustard for that price. So the old saying is, I just didn't do it again. <laughs> you always turn your head. That's a good bit. The good thing about it is that. You ain't forced to go in that market if you, if you don't think you'll make money at it. In fact, I just tell you the same thing. There are things that I ain't going to grow because I ain't going to make no money at it. So leave it to another somebody else that's got more mechanical mechanisms to be able to harvest it. Miller, and we'll stay with you uh, for the next question. And, and yours may be the, the answer for the next two, or you, if you get something uh, different, then you guys can add to it. But the next question involved, once that price is set, and, and and you deliver that product, how do you get paid? Or when do you get paid? Are you paid upon delivery or do you have to wait till it go through some purchasing department? Um, the US courthouse have fishes. I'm, I'm the biggest hold up for my operations. I, I got to do an invoice. So, you know, I wait, uh, as those saying is you wait a day or two, if you don't hear no complaints, it was good. Um, then I pose a follow invoice and I'm sitting here looking at, Probably the last three weeks left of invoices I ain't done yet. So, yes, uh, if it was, if I was efficient at it, you would still be up to 30 days of getting paid. And you, you like Patrick to tell you, you got to, there's no businesses like that. You know, there's um, the old way of uh, carrying your cucumbers to the stand and getting paid then, that's that's out of the market or anything. No markets ain't, ain't going to deal with that kind of cash money. No, so that's what I do. I um, invoice them. It goes into uh, their systems and it comes out of Atlanta, I believe, somewhere. Some, it ain't, it's somewhere in the United States. It used to come out of California, but I believe it's on the East Coast now, the building system. Well, good. Anything else to add? Is that pretty accurate? I know it's pretty accurate if Miller said it. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty accurate. Uh, Mr. Locklear stated, um, I'm a technology buff. So I love the system of being able to handle everything electronically. It helps with my taxes at the end of the year. Um, normally a net 15 or a net 30 is what we're accustomed to. So basically the way, way that it is, is how long it takes for us to get paid. The longer you take to submit the invoice, it can uh, be longer than get reimbursed. But um, I prefer this, that method than the cash accrual method of uh, most traditional farmers. Thank you all. We got a few more questions and then we'll uh, go to our Q&A uh, with some of the folks we have on, on with us tonight. Uh, to our farmers, how have you had to, how have you managed uh, your wholesale production alongside maybe some of your other markets uh, or your, you know, where you're diversified uh, for your operation? How do you kind of manage everything in your production, your planning, and, and so on? Miller, I see you on un, uh, you unmuted. We can start with you. <laughs> I um, you know, me and Laura's already talked about things for this spring and this summer, and uh, the other organizations that um, me and, uh, me and Mr. Weiss work with, you know, the church and stuff. So all these different organizations, I um, talk to everybody right now, so I know what the needs is. And so um, we're planning for that things. So, you know, there, there's so much that I know I could uh, let go through Laura's organization and the other two groups uh, knows what their needs is. If you can't plan and forecast and know the yields and them crops, that's just like Patrick saying, you, if you ain't got the records, I know what you can produce off that 100 foot row of uh, in your houses or you know, 200 foot in that field. Uh, you're hurting yourself in the whole market you enter into because you don't know whether you can get five cases, 10 cases. That's the thing about it. And I know what each one of my, um, the yields is associated with the crops that I've done for the last three years. So that's very important. you got to do all the paperwork and understand all the uh, cost is, you know, from your fertilize times, you know, like I'm more, I plowed that field five times and I got to set a number in my mind, like Patrick said a while ago about fuel, I might say it cost me twenty dollars an acre to plow. That's time, fuel, and, and maintenance on the track. You got to know all them costs. Good record keeping, Patrick. 
Yes, he, uh, Mr. Lockley is absolutely right. Um, I will go back and say again that if you don't plan out your growing year, you will get surprised at the end of the year if you're not able to cover some of the costs of production. Um, it's very important to know what you're planning and know the potential yield of what you're going to receive back. Um, secession planning is the most profitable process for us, but also crop diversification. Um, we just don't put all of our eggs into one basket. We try to utilize our land, all of it, instead, instead of a portion of it, by also offsetting the cost of each crop that's planted. So it helps to go towards labor expense, logistics, uh, supply, all those things are very um, valuable when you diversify your crop portfolio. Good, thank you. Lauren, I'll start with you with my last question and then we'll kind of see if we have any in the chat. We want to make sure that we've heard about all this, how to maintain good relationships, but we also want to know the, you know, what not to do. And could you speak to any examples of some things that may have led you to discontinue a relationship with a farmer? Um, so all of us that are listening and all the watch the recording will know not to do that. Yeah, well, and I would, right off the bat, I'd say that our biggest goal is to build a strong, trusting relationship with a farmer. It, it's to see how can we keep this partnership going for the long-term future. So it's very rare that we have a relationship with a farmer that doesn't work out. Um, it's, and trying to think through like a past scenario that hasn't worked out, I'd say the, the biggest thing would just be um, multiple continued issues on, on the same piece. So poor quality, poor communication, not letting us know that you know, a crop had finished or uh, if something was wrong. And in the past, we've overlooked some of those too, just to try and make sure that you know, if we can work through something to get to a better place, great. That's what we want to do. We recognize that there's going to be issues in farming and that's okay. It's always, if, if the farmer is willing to work towards a, a better future, then great, let's work towards that. I think the struggle is um, if there's a turnip crop and all of the greens get eaten and the farmer knows that those greens are eaten, but they still tell us that they've got turnips with tops, then we're looking at kind of a, a communication issue and, and that's not ideal. And so I, I think it's maintaining, you know, like any good relationship, how would you treat a good friend? And then working through that, if, if we can be a good friend and work through it together, then it's gonna be solid and we don't have to think about bad relationships at all. Cause that's the goal. How can we maintain loyalty and trust? Thank you, Lauren. I did notice I missed one question for our farmers. And then it's a good question to end on. What are some tips uh, that you can give any of the farmers listening today uh, that's looking at entering into a wholesale market? Uh, Patrick? I would say utilize what you already have. Um, instead of going into debt to try to meet a quota that you create for yourself. Start small, work, work hard at what your uh, original plan of action is put that plan of action into place and you will always be successful. Thank you. Bill? Uh, that's, that's the same thing I would do. You know, just uh, take one item, you know, I would uh, really wholesale to me would be meet up with somebody doing a CSA or these uh, food boxes. And that's something that you ain't got uh, one or two times, you know, then see if you can just do that instead of trying to say, well, I'll, I'll produce this for the next six months. That might be a little stretching that you do something that you, you got to start somewhere, but start small and not try to go there and obligate yourself that you can produce, you know, like okra come off for, for four months and you might not want to pick okra for four months. And tomatoes is the same way. Pat, me and Tad, you tell you, tomatoes every day crop, you might not have the time or, or the, uh, the infrastructure part to do all that. So look at what you want to do and start small and just try uh, try it for a couple of weeks. Don't obligate yourself for months, something you ain't never done before. Well, thank you, three. Um, my colleagues gave me uh, till seven o'clock to get my questions in and uh, I've got two minutes to spare. That's, that's pretty good for a recovering politician. 
Uh, I don't know if we have any questions in the chat, but if we have anyone that would like to unmute and maybe ask a question. Looks like you just muted yourself, right? After I made that comment, I think Lakita muted me. I um, didn't mean that. Sorry about that. No, I was just saying I didn't see any, uh, any questions in the chat. So if we had anyone uh, that wanted to uh, use a little reactions down there to raise their hand, we can call on them to unmute and ask their question if they have one. Greetings, y'all. I had a question about transport. Um, since you all don't really do the contracts, I was wondering how, when you pick up from farms, how that's kind of um, calculated and how that's deducted, um, or if that's like in advance. Do you want me to jump on that, Ray? Okay. Um, great question. Uh, what I would say is it's not the cost of logistics, at least when we're back hauling isn't coming out of what the farmer's making on the product. So if Patrick tells me a case of kale is $20, we pick up at that FOB $20 cost, and then we add on a buck 50 to backhaul it, but that cost is passed on to the end customer. So it's nothing that would come out of what the farmer's case price is. It's added on as a logistics cost, and then that's what we sell to the customer for. Now, if different wholesalers could have a different way of pricing, um, I would say if you're going into a co-op, it's worth it to ask the question on, does warehousing and logistics come out of my case price? For us specifically, it doesn't. The cost is uh, just covered by the customer, but any wholesaler could be different. So that's a really important question to ask whoever you sell to. Thank you for clarifying. For sure. Anything to add from uh, Miller or Patrick? All right, we have a question in the chat. Uh, they would like to hear more about the GAP certification process. They are in Maryland and um, they may have some resources with their extension department, but if you all just kind of could talk a little bit about the process you went to to, to earn your certification. Um. My me and Patrick said we uh these organizations here in North Carolina that we uh they advertise that they uh offer that program and it's very little cost to us. I believe it was like fifty dollars something like that to, to join the Carolina Farm Store Association. So that allows you to go into that program free then. Then you um once you get um take the program, it's like a two-day course and you work on your food safety plan, then the person reviews it. So hey, you're ready. So you submit that to the state, then you can schedule an audit. And, um, and like you were saying, there's a fee there, and they, the state pays half the fee the first year, or up to seven hundred fifty dollars. Where which one's uh, the least? So it, this, each state's got a different regulation. I believe South Carolina is a little different than North Carolina. I know. Anything to add, Patrick? No, uh, Millet stated everything that uh, that we went through to get our certification. Um, I do feel um, that is a great program when the state is able to pay up uh, up front for the first year. That's a great benefit to a farmer that's just getting started. Um, so I think the question came out of Maryland. I would uh, uh, say go find their uh, closest extension agent and um, see what programs or organizations are willing to help get through that process. Great. Patrick, we'll stay with you. We have another question in the chat and it um, is for our farmers and it asks, do you sense a lot of other farms out there that are ready for wholesale, but maybe not considering it? Or do you think most farms that could do it are jumping into it? Uh, I don't know if I can answer that question because I'm I can only speak to my area of the farmers in my area. Most of the farmers in my area are commodity farmers. So they don't, they don't uh, grow a lot of produce because they grow a lot of commodity crops like grain and corn and tobacco. Um, so it kind of helps a business like mine because if we're like the only or one, one, one or three 
uh, farms that are actually growing produce for the wholesale market, it gives us an opportunity to expand um, and scale. And then I see that maybe some farmers may want to um, add that product to their portfolio, but um, I really can't really answer to that because I don't have the experience to understand exactly, you know, what the farmers in my area are doing to add produce to their already existing portfolio. Thank you. Any insight on that, Miller? Um, what I've seen in here is that, um, you know, part of the Harmony Gap programs is that the farmers that um, direct sell, sometimes they left uh, self-harvest and um, me and Patrick can't have uh, anybody that's going out in our fields that, my, that has not been trained by us to harvest our vegetables. So the two bigger farmers in Maine, they, they like to stay into the direct sale market and not um, go into the wholesale. But there's a, one or two, I know one or two guys up in Moore County, he segregates the fields. You know, he's got his uh, wholesale field and he's got his direct sale field. So he, he follows the regulations of separating. And um, I do the same. You know, I have always got one or two fields of the same crop. And certain things, or I go harvest the vegetables for the person if I direct sell any. Gotcha. Thank you. We have another question. Uh, have you seen farm cooperatives selling wholesale or uh, working with buyers? Uh, Lauren, do you work with any cooperatives? Say mostly for us, we try and work direct with farmers just because anytime you're adding someone else into the mix, you'd want to make sure that um, they're adding a, a value into the supply chain. So if, if we're working with a farm co-op, we're typically looking for somebody who is adding in a logistical component who might get trucks or backhauling from a certain area that we don't backhaul from, or if they are a processor, like working landscapes um, up towards where Patrick is, is processing greens and then that adds an, a component their co-op but they're a processor so if it if there are features that we can't do ourselves as a distributor then yes we'll look to to work with other folks or like for example happy dirt in durham gets in uh, mustards from Asheville from lusty monk and we don't have trucks that can easily pick up at lusty monk so we'll buy that mustard from happy dirt because we have customers that ask for it um, so when they're adding into the supply chain, yes, if not, then we'll try to work direct, but then I, I know farm co-ops, we have a lot of fantastic farm co-ops on the East coast that have done incredible work with farmers. So it, it's, I, I think, connecting who and where and, and what works. So I've seen farm co-ops work together. I've seen wholesalers work with farm co-ops. So it just depends on who has what capability. Thank you. Patrick or Miller, are you guys part of any cooperatives and you know can speak to kind of how they may work? Yes, um, we have a few farms that we work together um, that I have kind of put together a strategy process to be able to make sure that we don't run out of supply. Um, of course, those farmers have to be GAP certified in order to participate, um, but it helps us to be able to not uh, hinder our relationship for not having a, a, a right quantity of product, so product. So a couple of farmers in my community, we have um, gotten together to create a market for some of the uh, church food bank organizations uh, throughout Wake County to be able to supply food uh, through share programs that the churches create. Um, and this year will be our first year uh, doing that cooperative. Um. Right now, we the two or three farmers here. We're just looking and see what a co-op would consist of take and everything. And like Pat just saying, you got certain guidelines they got developed. They got to get in place. And everything, but um, I know several different co-ops. Like Lars talked about Happy Dirt. There's a uh, Piedmont Growers out there. There's a lot of co-ops that is formed and really increased their capability and their capacity and put them into a whole lot good sized markets and everything. You know, no. So yes, there's uh, opportunities out there. Oh, go ahead, Bill. I'm sorry. I just, you know, co-ops is designed to bigger volumes and and be able to share the labor and the time. Like Patrick said, you know, if, if you have 
uh, capability of sharing the people and the, and the facilities, that's a, really a benefit. Now, I think that's what Piedmont growers do. They they build a facility and um, the Gullalus, if I said it correctly, them, them guys that got a facility, they'd be able to share and, and help us out with the cost. Because I hate to put in a hundred thousand dollar building just to, or chicken <laughs> just for my personal use. But if you you know if you get ten percent in there, hey, I don't mind paying ten. I won't pay a hundred. So that's one good benefit of co-ops is that uh, you can co collaborate your money and facilities and uh, still get a good benefit. Thank you, Miller. Patrick, I think we had a follow up um, with your comments. Um, and the question was, are you considered the prime in the relationship with the wholesaler? I would say yes, if you are the farmer that created the relationship or started the relationship with the wholesaler, then you should consider yourself the prime person um, and also be able to bring those other farmers into the conversation when developing the relationship. All right, thank you all. I think that's all I see in the chat. And uh, I'll give last call for anyone who would like to unmute and ask a question before I pass it along to my colleague, Lakita. I see Lacey has your, your hand raised. Do you have a question? You can yeah, unmute yourself. It's, it's okay. My questions are in the chat box, but I realized I don't know why I was writing the chat box instead of just coming off mute. So thank you. Uh, that was really helpful. And where I'm at in Maryland, um, the, these farm co-ops, I think, are becoming very popular in how small farmers can actually come together to have stronger negotiating power. And it was something I'm, I think is particularly interesting to see how we can leverage farm co-ops to, to get access to wholesale markets. So um, this, this conversation has been really, really interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Lacey. Great. Can I jump in on that real fast? Please. <laughs> and, and Lacey, I would say one farm co-op that Miller just mentioned that Miller, thank you. I totally slipped my mind. The Gullah Farmers Co-op down in St. Helena's Island, South Carolina. Um, I think some farmers, it's very difficult for them to market directly. And so in that case, yes, I think work for a wholesale bar to work directly with the farmers co-op when farmers really need that expertise of invoicing or packaging or any of those really makes sense for us to work with the Gullah Farmers Co-op. We just need to figure out the logistics, but when we can do that, I think they're going to be an awesome farm partner for us to buy from. And so it's it's really, can the farm co-op get that marketing word out? And I think putting together like grower buyer meetings and facilitating that marketing space that Patrick mentioned, is it texting photos to a buyer? Is it putting it out on social media? Using the leverage of the name of the farm co-op and getting that out to buyers is really helpful because the hardest thing for the buyer is just to know who's where and who's trying to sell product. Because there's a lot of folks that want to buy local food, it's just how do we find them. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you. All right, I'm going to pass it back over to you, Lakita. Thank you all to our panelists and, and thank you all for participating in our Q&A. Absolutely. Thank you, Ray. And again, thank you presenters for that very, very informative um, conversation tonight. I want to invite any of you who are on this call who may be interested in learning a little bit more about the Farmers of Color Network to go online at raffi.com uh, forward slash programs forward slash Farmers of Color Network. There are several ways to engage with our work, either as a farmer member who are actively producing right now, or as a supporter of our work, if you just wanna keep apprised of any happenings or opportunities. If you are an organization such as a business, a wholesaler, any sort of buyer, church organization, or other community group um, that's interested in supporting the work of the Farmers of Color Network, um, there's engage, ways to engage with us as well. So please do check us out um, at our website. And uh, here is the contact information of all of the folks on our team who you've heard from this evening. Feel free if any questions bubble up, um, any other topics that you'd like for us to cover um, as a part of this uh, market readiness series or any other programming um, that we may offer, feel free to shoot us an email 
to let us know what your ideas are. And you will receive uh, within the next few business days, a survey. We'd love to hear from you about how this event was for you. If there is something useful uh, that you heard, um, share with us your feedback. Um, we greatly appreciate that. And with that, I'll say good evening. Um, and again, thank you all for being on this on this webinar tonight. Uh, Y'all have a good day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Good night.